joining us uh, here uh, today. Uh, we look forward to uh, you know, having a discussion about uh, women's empowerment and uh, strength within Armenia, in the Armenian culture. And uh, we hope they'll join us uh, in this discussion. And um, at this point, I'd like to hand it off to the speakers. Thank you. Michael, thank you. Um, my name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. And I want to thank our hosts tonight, the Hubs Armenian Club, especially Michael for his hard work and uh, leadership. This program tonight is organized under the auspices of the uh, Nasser Alust Gulbenkian Foundation Lecture Series on Contemporary Armenian Issues. And I want to extend our thanks also to our great co-sponsors, for the evening, the Armenian Bar Association, the HEBU YP Boston, the Armenian International Women's Association, all ASAs at Boston area universities, and New Paths Bridging Armenian Women. So thank you to all those groups for coming together on this uh, evening's event. I also want to acknowledge the Committee for Contemporary Topics at Nasser that has worked hard to develop and organize tonight's panel, and without whom these programs we've been doing over the past several years would not take place. Uh, I think they're all here tonight. Uh, Shirar Balayan, Audrey Kalajian, Anna Ohanyan, Stepan Kalikian, Judy Sarian, and Olya Yard uh, uh, Yordanian. So thank you all for working to organize Uh, it's not entirely coincidental that this particular program is taking place at Tufts University. Uh, we've wanted to do one of our contemporary programs at Tufts for a while now, uh, but the appropriateness of having it here uh, is underscored by the fact that Tufts is... <laughs> okay, well, uh, we'll work on that. Tufts is unique uh, in having two chairs in Armenian studies, in Armenian art, in Armenian history, who are both women. I would like to acknowledge them, there, since they're both here tonight, Professors Ina Bakhtiyans McCabe and Professor Christina Maranzi. <laughs> Two friends I've had the privilege to work with for the past 20 years. And I should note that Professor Maranzi's pre predecessor, the first holder of the Dadian Ostamel Chair in Armenian Art and Architect Architecture, was also a woman, Lucy Dermanwellian, who really was responsible for creating the chair, and the major donor of the Darakchian Jafarian Chair in Armenian History, of which Professor McCabe has been the sole holder, was the late Ethel Jafarian Dublin, uh, who was also a benefactor of Nasser and of numerous other Armenian organizations. Um, and I need to announce two upcoming events at Tufts University uh, as well. Next Wednesday evening, and there are flyers out on the, uh, on the table over there, is the annual commemoration of the Armenian Genocide at Tufts University that is organized each year by Professor McCabe uh, and takes place at uh, Goddard Chapel at 7 p.m., uh, followed by a reception uh, at uh, Balu. Right. Uh, in the college room. Oh, in the college room of, of yeah, Hall. Yeah. And this year will feature a, a lecture by Dr. Sylvie Miriam of the Morgan Library of New York City. The following day, on April 19th at 7 p.m., the Cambridge Yerevan Sister City Association, uh, with the co-sponsorship of Nasser, will be presenting a panel discussion on 3D printing, the wave of the future. And there are flyers for this program uh, on the table over there as well. So last weekend, two of the sponsors of tonight's program, the, the Nasser Gulbenkian Series and the Armenian International Women's Association, were also co-sponsors of an important, and I think unprecedented, conference held at MIT, Feminist Interventions in Armenian Studies, Armenian Interventions in Feminist Studies. When we began discussing organizing tonight's program, we didn't know that that event was being planned. We didn't know that a thing called the Me Too movement would suddenly emerge last fall. We only knew from our own experiences and observations and discussions over the years that we had to do something on the challenges facing women in Armenian society. And that means not just in Armenia, but also in the diaspora. 
So we're very fortunate to have a terrific panel and an outstanding moderator. So I will now hand it over to Dr. Anna Ohanya, the Richard B. Finnegan Distinguished Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stoneville College. Anna. Thank you very much, Mark, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, it has been a pleasure to be part of the Contemporary uh, Speaker Series Committee um, because that, ha that forum has emerged as an important uh, mechanism to foster uh, debate and discussion connecting the Boston community and Armenia. At a time of increased authoritarianism around the world, unfortunately, this is an important, very important mechanism, very important forum. Um, the goal of this, I'm going to try to get out of your way very quickly because we have an outstanding panel. There is so much to cover. Um, but let me to, I would like to highlight that the goal of the panel is to focus on the centrality of women for economic development and political progress in Armenia. The key message of the panel is that supporting women economically and politically is a necessary precondition towards uh, building Armenian statecraft. Study after study have demonstrated that investments in women and girls make democracy stronger and weaken authoritarianism, make families healthier, peace agreements more durable, societies less vulnerable to extremism and violence. Unfortunately, study after study has also demonstrated that gender discrimination and physical assault on women are global and systemic in nature. Whether in peacetime or in war, in the privacy of their homes or at work and in public spaces, women are vulnerable to physical assault, discrimination, and gender inequality. An update on the physical assault on the elected members of the City Council on the Yerevan that took place in February, and perhaps Mara can provide an update on this as well. The activists in Armenia wanted to highlight that sustained civic mobilization around this issue is essential, um, and that sustained media coverage um, a will an engagement from diaspora or, uh, will help in empowering women, uh, but also keep the pressure on government to investigate the specific incident. And now on to the panel structure, and I'm finishing up. The key feature of Nasser's contemporary affair, uh, affair series is that these series are evidence-based um, in their approach to covering various complex policy issues. And um, the way these forums run and that they approach these issues in a comparative context. As with the previous panels, here too we have a distinguished academic, Professor Denise Horn from Simmons College, who will frame the conversation for us in terms that are global and comparative. We will then move to Navarth Manasyan to examine women's issues in Armenia in broad terms. Maru Matosyan will then take us down to the grassroots level, focusing on specific challenges of domestic violence. We will conclude with Nayari Karafian to learn about some models of diasporic engagement in Armenia, particularly with a focus on the younger generation. Um, the format is as follows. Um, we will start with Professor Horn, who will take 10 minutes to frame the conversation as mentioned, and then we will do two, if time permits, three rounds of questions, which I will direct to our panelists. Uh, we will then uh, are eager to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience. Um, so that is our plan. Um, for questions, uh, when the time comes, we do ask that you're concise and succinct, so we're able to cover as much ground as possible. Now, um, it is an uh, exciting part for me in the, uh, in the opening comments because I get to do introductions. Uh, Denise Horn is an Associate Professor and Chair of Political Science and International Relations and Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at Simmons, Simmons College in Boston. She's the author of Democratic Governance and Social Entrepreneurship, Civic Participation and the Future of Democracy, which was published in 2013 and Women, Civil Society, and the Geopolitics of Democratization, published in 2013. Dr. Horn is an international relations scholar whose work explores the relationship of civil society development to democratic growth, focusing on women's transnational activism and trends in global development strategies, such as social entrepreneurship. Uh, Dr. Horn is a 2014 Fulbright Scholar in Indonesia. 
She currently serves on the editorial board for Science, journals, uh, Journal of Women in Culture and Society, and is the current chair of the Feminist Theory and Gender Studies sections of the International Studies Associations, which is the major professional association for political scientists. Novart Manasyan, who is joining us over Skype, but it's 3 or 4 a.m. in Armenia. She's joining us from Armenia. Uh, thank you so much, Novart. Uh, she's, an, uh, uh, she's the Gender Equality Officer with UNICEF. Um, she's also an education expert with more than 10 years of experience in this sector. She has worked for the government and international organizations, managing projects and engaging in policy advisory development processes. Since 2007, she has been teaching at higher education institutions and has established a center for quality assurance in one of the universities in the country. In 2009, she joined the groups of uh, Tempus, higher education reform experts. She's a board member of Armenian Education Foundation that grants scholarships to students of Armenian descent. Uh, descent. Uh, she's graduated from the Engineering University of Armenia and holds two master's degrees from American universities. Amaru Matosian. Amaru Matosian was born in Romania. I didn't know. She has such a global background. And she immigrated to the U.S. in 1973, where she studied art history. She lived in Beirut, Montreal, Paris, and ultimately relocated to Armenia in 1991 with her family. She worked over two decades in the nonprofit sector as country director for both Aznar Work for Armenia Fund and for Tufekian Foundation, covering both Armenia and Karabakh. In 2010, she founded the Women's Support Center in Yerevan to assist and empower women victims of domestic violence as well as to advocate for the defense of women's rights in Armenia. As one of the founding members of the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Women, Mar is dedicated to the advancement of the status of women in Armenia. She is an activist and feminist in defense of civil society in Armenia, working with and for environmentalists protection of public spaces, and historic monuments, women, and rights of other marginalized uh, groups. Um, Nairi uh, Krafian, actually I have her uh, bio on my phone, because she's representing the younger generation and trying to be very uh, kind of uh, more moderate. And uh, by the way, my 12-year-old downloaded this on my phone so I could read it, and she point, pointed me to where I have to click the image with the picture, mommy. Nairi is a senior at Tufts University pursuing a bachelor's degree in biopsychology and will continue on to the Common School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University in 2019 following a gap year. She's the former president of both the Tufts Armenian Club and the Tufts Pre-Veterinary Society and an active member of the Armenian Youth Federation and the St. Stephen Armenian Church. She's the founder of um, uh, if you have to know Armenian to appreciate the beauty of this term, and I have a little she'll translate later. Oknushum, an animal therapy program she implemented with rescue dogs in Armenia last year. She'll be conducting research on the impact of animal therapy through this organization um, and hopes to recruit more members of the Armenian diaspora who are passionate about animals to be involved. We're looking forward to hear from Naidi about issues of violence as well as strategies of engagement in Armenia. So with this, I think this covers it all for now. So um, I will direct my first question to, um, once I find the right paperwork, there it is. Uh, we'll start with Professor Horn, as I already mentioned. So uh, what, um, uh, Professor Horn's background is really on the issues that we're covering. What perhaps would be better for us to get started, Denise, is if you could discuss the link between women's empowerment and democratization. Because it's not really so obvious to some of us who are not following that field closely. Um, any other areas beyond democratization where women's empowerment is consequential? Right, thank you. Well, first I want to thank you for inviting me to come. Uh, my work is not, has not been based in Armenia, but um, much of my work covers many of the issues that we're discussing tonight. Um, I'll just preface this with saying that my, my first book uh, was based on research that I did in Moldova and Estonia. So working in that sort of post-Soviet space in women's issues and civil society. Um, and my next book was based in Southeast Asia. 
but a lot of these, uh, these issues is to share common ground. So I'm glad you asked me about empowerment, um, because this is the main issue. Defining empowerment is very difficult, and nobody has actually done it in a satisfying or, or a satisfactory way. Um, and it's uh, an issue that I'm struggling with. So generally when we're talking about um, empowerment, uh, we're generally talking about it in the context of issues. So um, employment, uh, political participation, uh, education for girls. Um, and most data on gender um, equality is actually looking at gender inequality, um, but not really getting to what empowerment means. So uh, the World Bank has a definition of empowerment. It says it's the process of increasing capacity of individuals or groups and, um, to allow them to make choices and transform those choices into um, uh, desired outcomes and actions. So it's really about agency and personal agency. So empowerment as a process rather than um, as a thing, if that makes sense. So when we're talking about democratization, and this is something that um, you know, in the early 2000s when I was in Moldova was something we were struggling with. How is Moldova going to become um, a democracy after years of Soviet um, control? And, and Armenia, I'm sure, struggled with many of these issues. Well, one of the things that all the foreign funders said was that, well, you have to empower the women. They have to be politically empowered. And that sounded really easy at the time, and I was there and young and, and hopeful, um, and thinking, well, we'll work with women's NGOs. And that's a sign of a strong civil society or NGOs that are supporting women. Well, they weren't there. So then what do we do? Oh, well, let's create them. Um, but just creating the NGOs in and of themselves doesn't change the context in which they were operating. So it really was about um, how do we make um, democratization and women's empowerment part of a larger cultural conversation. Um, and I found that to be the same in other places where I'm looking at democratization. I'm working in Indonesia right now, and we are still having these conversations. How do we change the culture? Um, so one of the things that we sort of look at when we're looking at women's position within uh, particular societies is sort of, you know, where are they placed? How, how are women sort of um, considered in society? We have some good measurements of that. Uh, we have the Human Development Index, but we also have the um, Gender Inequality Index, and that's sort of one of the things that I look at when I'm trying to think of where are women's place within society and how can we make the case for um, greater um, attention to women's empowerment. Um, so I went and I, I looked at um, Armenia and its rankings in the Gender Inequality Index. Um, right now they're ranked 84. Um, this is out of 159 countries. Um, and ranked 84 between Algeria and Ukraine. Um, and uh, that's actually, we, Armenia's gone up in the past uh, year or so. Um, so th there's three different measurements of this uh, for the inequality index. It's reproductive health, which is uh, looking at maternal mortality rates, but also adolescent birth rates. Um, employment, um, economic status, that is. And then um, political participation. How, what is the proportion of parliamentary seats? government um, and how many women receive secondary education. Armenia does really well in terms of education. Um, but these other factors as well, how do we determine um, you know, why women aren't more involved um, in politics, for instance. Interesting note about Armenia is that we have a very high number of uh, women in the population in Mar um, Armenia. Their act is actually higher than the men. I think it's 54% women. In Armenia. So where is the disparity? Um, and this is the question that comes out in many different societies. How is it that we can have higher numbers of women? And in most countries, I think 84% uh, of countries have higher numbers of women than men. Why aren't we seeing more political participation? And how do we get to that issue of empowerment? Well, if we're just looking at how do we get women into the economy, we might be missing something really important. Um, lots of women were in the economy during the Soviet period. That was kind of, you had to be in the economy. But what kind of work are women doing? Are they doing the work of three people? Meaning they're out and they're doing a job out in public and they come home and they're also doing the housework and they're taking it and they're responsible for childcare. So they have that triple burden, right? We have to look at that. What kind of work are women permitted to do? Um, what kind of space do we open up for women in terms of economic empowerment? Um, one of the things that I was interested in in my second book was this notion of social entrepreneurship and women's empowerment. And there's all this I talk about microcredit and microfinance. 
um, and this would be empowering for women. Well, in fact, it wasn't. Um, studies have shown that in many cases um, it led to more uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence, and women being wrapped up in a, in a greater debt cycle. So we got that wrong in many situations. Um, women's education is great. And we can look at rates of women's education, and that's really important. But does that translate to further empowerment? Um, so instead of looking at women's empowerment in terms of those three um, situations, women in the economy, women um, um, being educated, we have to think about the difference between liberal and liberatory empowerment. And so I've been talking to a lot of women about this, and, and hopefully um, um, you can speak more to this. That we're talking about liberal empowerment, we're just focusing on what the things we can measure, how many women are working. But when we talk about liberatory empowerment, um, we're actually talking about women's movements and following women's movements and how powerful those women's movements are in society. And are they moving the needle? Are they forcing a discussion within society that changes the culture somehow um, to a point where it is deemed um, obviously appropriate for women to be involved in politics? It's obviously important for women to be elected. Um, it's obviously important to create quota systems, for instance, that allow for more women to be on the ballot um, in societies. So it's really about a cultural shift when we're talking about democratization. It's not just about measuring these, these uh, singular factors. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it there, and then we can open it up for other discussions uh, or afterwards. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. This is very helpful. And um, so I have a few more questions for us. So we'll return. <laughs> Not so easy, huh? Um, and we'll move to Navard. Navard, can you hear me? Oh, I have to look there. I'm looking at the screen. Um, Navard, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, very good. I think I can hear you. A little bit of echo, but I can hear you. Okay, excellent. So, um, oh, what, what, what I was hoping you could start with is that you could tell us about the scale of the problem surrounding women's exclusion, issues of human rights. Uh, you've been working in this area for some, quite some time now. Have there been changes over the years, positive or negative? Denise already got us going with some numbers um, on, uh, on these trends. So I would appreciate if you would take it from here. Um, let me try to give a very brief overview of the new data that I have come across. The striking ones, uh, and I'm now picking on the, the very fresh ones, is the unemployment rate uh, that is one of the highest uh, in the region, Europe and Central Asia. This is the very recent data from International Labour Organization, and women face that more than 17% of women face unemployment in our opinion. Another uh, very striking uh, kind of uh, data and uh, reality is the gender wage gap, which is again among the highest uh, in the world. Uh, coming very close to 36%. Uh, another really big problem, which is actually throwing our media down the bottom of all the indices on gender gap, is the uh, gender bias sex selection. Armenia is topping the chart uh, with three other countries. And there is an interchange uh, from year to year, but it's the three and four countries. China, India, Azerbaijan, and Armenia that is actually uh, selecting for birth, birth leaders, female leaders, uh, before the birth. Um, and this is due to some preference. The ratios are so skewed that when you look at the health and survival submitted when measuring the gender gap globally, Armenia is actually talking the chart with this big country. Uh, the picture has improved over these uh, five, six years. Uh, the ratio has come down from 116 to 1 However, uh, the repeated studies show that there is no change in some program. Uh, and that is the uh, alarming uh, kind of revelation that over these years, with a lot of work, which actually has improved uh, uh, over at the output in Armenia, uh, 
But when people are asked, they still need the same reasons for preferring the sons of the fertile uh, and resorting to uh, sex selection. I can't go into the um, inter internet nature of public and public sphere. How the poison agency within the uh, household and the asymmetries uh, are linked very much to gender inequalities and uh, disempowerment of women, and how it is important for me to look at the household economics and household power relations to understand. How is it that after receiving education, women opt out of public um, uh, speaker? They opt out of being represented in different sphere of public life. And that's how we come to see that there is very few MPs uh, in our parliament. And so I think that people of the earth, I can live in here. Um, Okay, very good. This, this is a lot for us to process, so we're going to come back to explore some of the numbers um, you uh, presented there. Now, let's move to Maro Matosian. And um, I can go both ways, Maro. I can go directly straight to the domestic violence problem and the law that was passed, but I'm wondering if we could keep that for now. And I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about the areas in Armenia where women's disempowerment then exclusion has been most consequential for Armenia's democracy, the democratic future, economic progress. I know you have a lot of views on this, and I'm hoping you can share some, some of those here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think it's a good segue between Novart and uh, Dennis to uh, say basically that the woman empowerment, as Dennis also mentioned, is uh, strongly linked to democratization. We know that. Uh, and there's a strong correlation between democratic government and the eradication of poverty. Now, the strong correlation between poverty and neoliberal policies, and some of them pushed by the World Bank, uh, have left women primarily affected by poverty, which intensifies the gender asymmetry. So when we have that, uh, we, uh, these policies, what does it imply? It implies budget cuts, uh, we also have a lot of corruption, cuts in socio-economic safety net, and also, all these leave women uh, more impoverished. And we've seen this uh, in increasing numbers, uh, the, the, the poverty in Armenia, according to um, government data, is 54% of the population, and, and it's primarily affected to uh, women. Now, besides the policies, we also, in Armenia, we have an issue of patriarchal society. And I think you know what that means, where men decide and, you know, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. sorry. Uh, is this better? Sorry. Yes, much better. So, um, in the patriarchal society, you know that um, that women are the majority, the men are the majority, they lead, they decide, they feel entitled. And this also creates significant barriers to women in the, uh, to women's autonomy and also in the economic and political power of women. And all this hinders empowerment. Now, the areas uh, that most affect, are affected uh, women empowerment is the that is also mentioned, are in labor and employment, education, and uh, political um, uh, arena. Now, in policy, I understand that, and nobody can correct me, but I think that there is a quota um, imposed on the government to have 30% of, of women representation in government, uh, parliament and government. So, uh, we will see wh where that goes. Georgia has made a goal of 50-50, which is really ideal, and we'll see if they will, they will succeed. But the numbers are not enough. Uh, this is not, uh, as said, it's not a numbers issue. It's really a mentality. It's really the attitudes of society. 
is really how we uh, as citizens uh, view each other. Uh, do we view women in equal terms uh, or do we view women as, um, um, you know, um, um, dependent of men or a lower class or women that cannot really uh, 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 be empowered. Because the rhetoric in Armenia after independence was that women should really stay at home and take care of the family. And this rhetoric we did not hear during Soviet times. And why it happened after independence? The jobs were scarce and men in this patriarchal society immediately took over the job market. And the women primarily were relegated to service provider um, jobs, service provision, the management were all men. And uh, the role of the women has diminished in this, uh, with this rhetoric. And uh, when they were talking about leadership position, we always hear chisasu, vayelche, you know, vayelche. You know, it, it does not becoming to a woman to be a leader. You know, it's, it's aggressive, it's domineering, um, so therefore uh, it's not encouraged for women to to have the, the, that type of jobs. So attitudes like this, um, also sexual harassment in the workplace, um, have allowed for women not to hold leadership positions and not to be empowered. Uh, and this is probably the biggest uh, handicap that we face. Thank you, thank you very much. Lots to explore, so I'm going to come back again. Uh, let's move to uh, Naili. Naili, I, I was wondering if you could, some of the things that we discussed when preparing for the panel was this tension um, between influencing the desire to um, get diaspora Armenians to get involved and if you're a woman, what, if you can tell us a little bit about your experiences in working in Armenia, number one, it's really admirable as to how you identify a problem in Armenia, you pack your bags, you go form connections and get the job done. Uh, so I love that, but I was wondering if you could explore a little bit how uh, did you navigate some of this uh, difficulty surrounding issues of gender and sexism that were mentioned, discussed by the panelists? Yeah, so can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I was really going with a plan to work with animals and help animals, and I wasn't thinking about women's empowerment or anything, but I kind of uh, fell upon it in a few ways. So first of all, I was, uh, I'm working with shelters in Armenia, dog shelters, and when I got there I realized they're exclusively run by women. Um, so I had a very unique experience in that I was working with women who had started their own organization and were running their own organization. Some of them actually, one of them, no, two of them had men employees that worked for them, um, taking care of the dogs or driving the dogs. Um, so that was very interesting, and so I didn't really have to deal with any like, workplace sexism. Um, but what I did experience was more like day-to-day -day things in cab rides with people asking me why I wasn't married, people offering their sons for me to marry, <laughs> um, people asking why I would work with dogs. Um, and so it's difficult for me because I do really want to recruit people and uh, I've had multiple actually parents reach out to me on behalf of their daughters, um, diaspora and Armenians telling me how much their daughters love what I'm doing and how they want to help. And uh, just in the past two weeks, we had one lemonade stand for, uh, to fundraise for us and one birthday that the girl asked for uh, gifts to open shoot in lieu of presents for herself. Um, so I really want to engage these girls and also um, girls in the field of animal medicine and animal care because uh, veterinary medicine is also very heavily women. Um, and so the pre-vet society here is all women and I want them to come to Armenia with me and help me and have the opportunity to learn the way I did. But then um, I have these experiences there where I don't want them to experience that. Um, and so I think there needs to be a more real discussion with individuals doing things like I did birthright, um, different internships about what they're going to experience there. Um, did you want me to talk about the link that I took? talking to you about, or not yet? Um, about what? 
Yeah, why don't you tell us? Okay, okay. Um, and then the other uh, big thing that I kind of realized more recently, I'm in a class uh, called Human Animal Interactions, and um, we talked about domestic violence and animal abuse and the connections between them. Uh, we learned about an organization that is like a shelter for women that allows pets because a lot of women don't leave dangerous situations because they don't want to leave their pets because they know their pets will be abused. Um, and so there's a lot of overlap in that um, the patriarchal attitude and the, the struggle for men to exert their power that goes over everyone who's not a man. So women, children, and animals. Um, so it becomes a kind of way for them to exert power over people, uh, either in addition to abusing people or if there's an animal that they know someone cares about, um, they can use abuse of the animal to threaten the person. Um, I know of one case of someone who adopted a dog from Armenia who was living in a foster home and um, the dog ended up being really behaviorally messed up and um, had a very hard time living with that family and they had to give it to the trainer because the foster family in Armenia, the wife had wanted to foster the dog and asked the shelter and they let them foster it and then it turned out afterward that the, the husband in the home had been feeding the dog. Um, so there's definitely a link shown there. Um, there's also data on uh, just with the connection of violence that violence against animals is kind of like a foot in the door and um, a pretty actually good chunk of normal people do uh, some, to some extent, some type of animal violence when they're children. It's quite common, um, but the percentage of them who do and the like level of violence in what they're doing is significantly higher in school shooters and um, serial killers. So it's very, it's definitely uh, just kind of it's the level below. Um, it's not quite hurting a person, but it's hurting a little creature, and so. There's the danger in that and the connection of the women and the dogs having that similar experience of being powerless in a society dominated by men. Fabulous. Thank you so much. I have to revise my syllabi. The way I teach peace and conflict studies and violence, I have to completely go over it. We need to have coffee sometime soon. Thank you. Um, so we're going to zoom out to the global level again and back to Denise. So Denise, what I was hoping you could uh, tell us a little bit more um, is the the cost, what are the implications of leaving women behind um, uh, for communities, for societies, for states? Um, what are the mechanisms in doing so? How do, they, how, how do women become excluded? What are the mechanisms? And I was hoping you could draw from your experience in Southeast Asia. Okay. Well, that's a lot to <laughs> unpack. Um, well, the implications for leaving women behind, I think, may be obvious to to me, I don't know, obvious to everyone, but uh, we were just talking before the panel started on levels of funding, for example, for domestic violence shelters, um, for um, women's organizations. Um, the implications of leaving women behind in democracies is that women's interests don't, aren't represented. Now this is not to say that every woman who is voted into office is going to represent all women's needs, right? So we, we see situations where you say, well, we have this number of women in office, but these are very conservative women, and they're not necessarily concerned, say, with welfare policy. So we have Margaret Thatcher as a prime example of that. Um, so the question is, how do we uh, get more women who are more willing to bring these policies to the fore? Now, we have examples of countries that have done very well in this. Um, so in terms of gender quotas, for example, if we look at Sweden, um, who, they have one of the highest numbers of women um, in, uh, in the parliament, however it's not 50-50 yet, and they've been doing this for 40 years or so. Um, but the parity is, is, is fairly high. Um, and out of that, we've seen the development of very high welfare programs, um, um, pretty substantial welfare programs that include parental leave, both maternal and paternal leave, um, public crushes, funding for daycare, childcare, um, and we also see a high emphasis on uh, women and girls' education. But also, from a global level, the development of now what they're calling a feminist foreign policy. Um, so there are implications to having this idea that uh, societies that are more inclusive 
of men and women and the needs of families particularly will also possibly reflect that in their foreign policy making. And that's fairly new. We don't quite have evidence yet for what that would look like, but that's something we're working on. So the implications of leaving uh, women out or behind the democratization process is that this patriarchy that you're talking about becomes so normalized that we become blinded to the needs of, of half of society. Um, but that also hurts men in society as well. So we have patriarchal societies that have an emphasis on uh, the men in charge, the men doing the work, uh, the men outside of the family in the public sphere rather than the private sphere. We have families that become distorted as well, uh, where fathers are not uh, uh, brought up to care about their children in the same way, because possibly that wouldn't look manly if they were doing the child care or the housework. So we have lots of evidence to show how harmful it is on both uh, when you have highly patriarchal societies that don't include women. Um, and then your second question, I forgot what it was now. Um, oh, Southeast Asia. All right, well, so I've been doing uh, work in, in Indonesia for the past seven years or so, and I've been very interested to see um, what's happening in that situation. Now, Southeast Asia, I mean, well, Indonesia is an interesting case, because in the 1950s, um, just post-independence from the Dutch, if you're familiar with Indonesia at all. Uh, we, Indonesia had one of the, high, the most um, popular and populated women's organizations in the world. Um, they had this huge organization of feminists, and they were sort of radical feminists, and they were fighting for things like ending polygamy within Indonesian society, and they were fighting for women's equality. Um, and they were doing pretty well up until the point they started making demands and the state started having to respond to, um, say, the United States who was worried about the spread of communism. And so uh, when we had a, 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 you could call it a coup, they brought in um, Suharto, they shut down women's organizations. Women's organizations were sort of subsumed under, um, under a, sort of like an appendix to government organizations. So they were like official women's organizations, but they were defamed, right? Um, so in that process, women became less and less involved in politics, um, and there's sort of that, that's why I was saying when we look at women's social movements and looking at women's movements is really important because seeing how much those women are involved in policy and, and how much they're listened to is an indicator of how much actual political clout they have. Um, so in the case of Indonesia, it's become more conservative. And this is a, a, a fear um, that many ways who study women's social movements particularly is that they'll get co-opted and then their mission and their, um, their rhetoric becomes less and less radical in the sense that they just kind of fit in with sort of what's acceptable rather than changing what's happening in society. So the danger of women's organizations being co-opted either through funding as we go through privatization, and that's something that I've studied through this neoliberal context, right? So women's organizations are, you know, not can't make any demands from the state and they have to get their funding from elsewhere. It's their funders who are going to determine the kinds of policies they have. So in the case of um, family planning, for instance, if there are women's organizations that are depending on, say, the U.S. government to give them money for family planning, well, guess who gets to determine what they, what they do? And we can see through the Trump administration that not much, right, in terms of women's rights um, and um, bodily integrity. So we have to ask, you know, how much is neoliberalism sort of limiting um, the, the discourse under which women can demand rights uh, worldwide? Thank you. I didn't think of it that way. Thank you. Um, Navarre, um, what we're hoping you could tell us a little bit, you started actually talking about this already. Um, if you could explore a little bit more the costs and consequences of excluding women from political life. And I was wondering if you would also focus on education. What role does education play in promoting um, uh, women uh, in the political sphere, and have you noticed any changes in political participation over time? Anecdotal evidence, I mean, some of the peace activists are mostly women, at least I see them very active in the streets, but I don't have the data, so that's one form of participation, but also women in a parliament. And related to that, and I'm going on and on, the quotas, I mean, uh, do, they, uh, do they work? I wonder if we could have a conversation on that. Um, so if you could take it from here. I uh, think it would be uh, maybe coming from the quotas. Um, uh, the parliament and the elected officials, the elected 
year, the quotas are applied in Armenia. In the government, we don't have um, quotas um, for the public sector. In fact, there has been no audit, uh, labor audit done from the perspective of gender equality to understand the uh, level of representation of women at all levels of public um, of public uh, sphere and uh, of government. Uh, on uh, political participation, its relation to education, uh, and how uh, women's participation, uh, did I get it right, how women's participation in political life impacts the... Uh, what role does education have, if at all? I mean, there are more women enrolled in colleges and universities, I believe, than men. Is it, do we need more, uh, uh, is it specific type of, I don't know, trainings, political education, how you run for a campaign, or, or is it general, are we looking for specific, is there a need for a specific type of education with specific content, or um, are there effects from education in general, higher education, for example? Should there be? I would want to look at education from a narrow and broad perspective. The narrow looking at the formal education and actually having um, um, Apple data on how stereotypical content and stereotypical pedagogy is impacting girls. Uh, how uh, all that is disempowering them into uh, making informed and free decisions. And when later in life you come to see them in higher education, one of the reasons why women are underrepresented in STEM fields is exactly linked to this uh, stereotypical content and pedagogy in the earlier years of formal education. Actually, the very recent report of the Committee of, of Women in November of 2016 Pinpoint this aspect of public policy in Armenia and the need to remove the content, remove the pedagogy. And uh, this, we go broader and look at education as something that goes beyond uh, for the institution. It, it embraces media, it embraces peer learning. And uh, I am now going to again come back to private spheres, our lives in private spheres in our households. Power is a conflict more than anything else. So if I, as a woman, and anyone doesn't practice it every day, uh, how we are going to embrace that? Alert to be powerful. Because we talk about empowering people. So if you look at practices around household, how women and men relate to certain aspects of life, it's part of education. We grow as children in households. We see this power dynamic within the households more than in the demonstrations, in the parliaments. It's later in our life that we come to learn how the public relations are all, you know, um, are all structured. But we see our mom and dad in action. So, if women have this huge aspect in, in decision making, and actually that is what we are measuring right now, we don't have the data for it yet. We have the data for modern, not for young people. If um, the attitudes and norms of the society are such that whatever decision I take as a woman is not welcome because of my gender. Uh, that's part of the education, that's part of the polar education that sips into my peer exchange as a child, as a girl child. Truly, there's a lot of research that shows how uh, girls and boys change their skin after babies in India. How the self-esteem be reinstated and how the self-esteem, the very natural self-esteem, me being good. Really girls losing that after being exposed to media, that's an education. So for all these people need to be looked at to understand how gradually we live in lack of um, uh, differences of <coughs> and how that actually impacts the uh, manifestation. Because we need to remember 
that we are 52 percent of the nation in Armenia. Yet our representation at any level is not that no man even to have it. Uh, so maybe I stop here, but I think there's a lot, a lot of that needs to be done on the voice part of the voter education of the country. Um, and I think that's where we haven't really looked a lot. We need a lot of attention, we need a lot of studies in this year. And actually, I think we have always talked about education and uh, tax the targets for education. We somehow have overlooked the media. Uh -huh. that's, a, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, let's move to Maro. And Maro, I was hoping um, uh, if you could tell us a little bit uh, about the scale of the domestic violence in Armenia, enacting this uh, as on the law. I mean, I met you during a protest, <laughs> right, in Armenia, that's how we met, uh, focused on uh, domestic violence. Um, so if you could tell us as to what are the sources, causes, consequences, and what are the challenges in working in that area as an activist? How much do I have to talk about? I'll give you five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we had agreed on three, but... <laughs> yeah, no, I'm more interested in the questions in the audience, so I'll be very brief. Okay. Um, uh, domestic violence, as you know, it's a global problem, so Armenia is not spared by it. Unfortunately, uh, in the Soviet times, we did not address these issues because those are very taboo. Uh, and uh, the, the Soviet society was that concept that uh, the society is perfect, this problem, the social issues are problems of the Western world, we don't have these issues, so therefore we never discussed. With the independence, when these issues were brought forth, uh, the society was shocked that we have such issues in Armenia, and the diaspora was shocked also. Uh, the lack of legislation until now and the uh, lack of protection of women have made that uh, domestic violence really um, came out with a vengeance uh, in society. It was also triggered, it was not the cause, but it was triggered a lot by uh, poverty and unemployment. So, uh, right now we have one in four women uh, affected by domestic violence. Uh, and um, uh, we, since 2010, there have been known 50 deaths uh, due to violence, to, uh, to abuse. Uh, I'm saying known because uh, many times the abusers try to cover up, saying that it's an accident, that it was suicide, and if he has power and money, he can bribe and he can cover up for that. If uh, I could interrupt quickly, actually in the security studies area, that indicator amounts, is considered a uh, low intensity conflict. Meaning if you have that many soldiers dying at the border as in, in, a, in a conflict area, that will qualify, uh, that will be coded as a conflict, as war. Right, right. So, um, uh, of course, when domestic violence, the more we talk about it and the more women are aware that uh, they can be protected and they, there is a way out and they can um, receive shelter and protection, the more the calls are increasing. Um, and uh, this is how uh, the awareness also helps to alleviate the problem as well. Because if we keep it taboo all the time and we don't talk about it, the problem does not go away. But if we talk about it and we try to pass legislation and advocate for women's rights, the, uh, the issue uh, becomes... Um, uh, for example, when I started, the government was in complete denial that we had, there is such a problem. Then they said that, oh, there's some bad apples in the society, or there's a Western problem, we don't have that, that issue. And then when more evidence was brought forth, and more data and more uh, when we work together with the agencies and with the police and we brought case and case after case after case, then they could not deny. And also we were um, very instrumental in publicizing these cases. We had two very public cases uh, that uh, were covered on TV and uh, in the media and that opened the floodgates. 
that really made uh, this um, debated issue in, um, in society. Whereas uh, in 2010 there was no discussion in the media, no article on this topic. Now we have about 30 to 40 programs on TV or articles per month dealing with this issue. So this is becoming increasingly more uh, discussed and uh, uh, women and men more aware of it. Um, and it's important this because it creates an awareness among young girls as well and they also we need, they need to be educated because you know you really do not see, you, you really do not realize uh, how um, uh, inequality works and how patriarchy works, how gender stereotype works. And when uh, we talk to young women and they, they, they say that uh, our boyfriends, they don't allow us to wear this dress or go to see friends or, or visit the family or they feel that or they're extremely jealous, they think that this is a sign of um, uh, love for them. And they don't see that this is a controlling relationship that leads into abuse. So um, the more awareness there is, the more also we strive to combat these gender stereotypes and, to, and towards a more egalitarian society where women also look for equality and demand equality and demand to be treated with respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we'll move to Naidi. I have one specific question, Naidi, to, to you. Very often you hear within diaspora, we do want to get engaged, but we don't have connections, we don't know where to start. Uh, and in my work, I always advocate people to, to try to develop networks within their profession. doesn't matter what you do. So I was wondering, uh, psychologically, how did you go about thinking that way, number one? And more logistically, how did you find the connections? Was it a cold call? Did someone make an introduction? How did you go about uh, to, number one, identifying the problem, and number two, developing a strategy and executing it? So I went to Armenia the year before in 2016 um, with my dance group and that's when I really noticed the, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, the issue, um, all, really all, any issues in Armenia, because I had last found in fifth grade and it was this magical place and then I went back in 2016. Whoa. Um, um, so I noticed just poor treatment of animals, lots of stray animals, and mostly just a lack of the beautiful connection that people here have with their animals that benefits them and us. So at first I just wanted, I, uh, I was visiting shelters there during our, my tiny bit of free time and thinking that I would come back in 2017 and just volunteer at a shelter. Um, but throughout the years I thought about it, I realized I needed to do something uh, to show people how great dogs are. Um, and I thought about some education stuff, uh, but I didn't want to come in and be like, I'm from America, this is my opinion and it's right. So I was like, how am I gonna show them that dogs are great and not just tell them? So then I, real I thought about animal therapy and how great that would be. And so I actually researched online to find uh, places that might want to have therapy dogs. Um, and then in terms of connecting with the shelter that has the dogs, I had visited it when I was in Armenia in 2016. And so, you know, they have Facebook and email and everything. And so I connected with her. She does therapy with horses. Um, and so she was super interested in this. Um, she already kind of uses the dogs as a therapy, but I was proposing to you know, have a good strategy to certify them and make sure that we have handlers that know what they're doing. And so um, when you get to Armenia, like people from all these like little corners of your life that haven't talked to you in years are like, hey, I know someone in Armenia. Um, so actually my dad's cousin sent me the information of the fund for Armenian Relief to go talk to them more on like the fundraising kind of things. And they mentioned that they have a children's center. Um, and they asked if I wanted to visit it just to look at it. And I did, and it was really nice. And it wasn't until I was literally like walking out the door from my tour being like, do you think you want to have dogs here? <laughs> and um, then I sent them all the information and 
they were like, yeah, so we started doing it, and um, the kids really love it. Uh, the third time we went, we were a little late, and the kids all have to wash their hands when we get there. Um, and there was this girl, and she was about to pet the dog, and I asked her, have you washed your hands? And she said, I washed my hands a long time ago. I've been sitting by the door waiting for you. <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot of like people reaching out and saying, I know this person, I know this person, and being brave enough to just go places. I didn't think far would be a place for me to take my dogs, and it was just by coincidence. Well, thank you. Thank you very much and keep doing what you're doing. Um, so what I would like to do um, is to uh, invite you to submit your questions. And, but before I do that, I wanted to simply reflect as to um, how important the cultural shift is. Going in, I really was not thinking in those terms. What is emerging from all of the answers from Navard, Navard is talking about that it's not only about the formal education, it's about the media, and it's about sort of the surrounding environment, and Denise has been talking about supporting social movements, women's movements, as opposed to thinking at the organizational level. So I guess um, the challenge is really significant. How do you shape culture? How do you change culture? And probably the answer you start at all levels. You have to do everything possible to produce this level of sort of a, a critical mass of a little steps that will produce the change that we want. With this, I'll get out of the way, get out of your way, and I'd like to invite questions to any of the panelists. And I'll take three at a time. And uh, again, please keep it to two minutes, questions ideally, and a comment if needed. So let's go, uh, let's start from all the way to the back. One, two, three. Very good.
situation pretty high level with the ministry, one of the ministries. But she, uh, they talk about her experience during the long time when she was pretty young. And, uh, but she got married, and then her husband got jealous because of her power. So she kicked him out. And uh, so she's you know, a single mom, and she's uh, reached a pretty high position in the government. Anyway, that's just a point of information, and I can uh, make that article available to Mark. I will email it to him so anybody interested can in access it through Mark. Thank you. And I'll take the third question from Stephen. Uh, my question would be for either Mato or Levar, people that are in Armenia on the ground. It has to do with the legislation, the domestic violence legislation. You know, legislation can pass for a number of reasons. Obviously, a large part of this legislation has to do with the great work the activist community has done in putting visibility and pressure on the government. But I feel like it's a defensive piece of legislation. Um, that people's behaviors don't change overnight. You said they were in denial in 2010. Well, in 2017 or 18, they're probably feeling a lot of heat. My question is, what do you think the prospects are that the legislation will be enforced? That there will actually be people arrested, prosecuted, and jailed for these kinds of crimes, making visible examples in society that this is not going to be tolerated. I mean, on the one hand, there's education, and there's increasing the self-esteem of women so that they don't have to take this kind of stuff. The other half has to do with the enforcement, the law enforcement community saying, when these things happen, we're actually, we're not going to wink, wink, and look the other way just to have something on the books. Thank you. Navar, perhaps let's start with you. Maybe you can take this question and then we'll go to the panel and Ramana can take the other questions. Yeah? The, yeah, Navar, uh, did you hear me? Uh, can you answer um, Stefan's question in regards to the legislation? I, I heard parts of it, um, and as I understand, what's the view on uh, the law? Um, and on the process, if we're going to see um, implementation, enforcement. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, let me um, just uh, say that this is one act in a very long process. I don't look at legislation as something that is putting the, the kind of, um, uh, you know, final mark. Uh, it's more on the preventive side than on the punishment, stronger on the prevention than on the punishment, and Marl can give more insight into it. Um, but in both court, if there are no other supportive formative acts uh, that will have to be developed to actually to make the prevention um, a real, real process. Uh, because there are clauses that need further substantiation of, for instance, reconciliation. Uh, and we need to look at reconciliation on the power asymmetries and how the public institutions as institutions of deliberation are actually going to do it in an equitable way. These are the questions that we have to ask, and these are the Supportive and formative documents come. Another level is when I think the uh, person who posed the question is very much related to how we're going to take things. It's on a very culturally normative side. And yes, laws are one part of the necessary um, kind of social contract, but on the other side, there is a need for a continued process of transformation of demobilization of violence and how it's perceived. And that actually, again, means uh, relearning around decision-making. And that's very much linked to the boards we would have in public and private. So we relearn how we communicate and relate to personally 
and that's a very that that asks for a lot of a lot of input and a really happy work. Mara has been doing this for so many years. Awareness raising, advocacy, providing the services. I think the awareness raising is very very important. Where you know that okay, violence is not normal, not free. So let's think all together. Very good. Thank you very much. Perhaps Mara can continue this as well as you can take up some of the other questions that were yeah, I, uh, I just want to say that legislation in itself is not a solution. However, legislation is also very important. Why? Because it gives a message to society that this is not acceptable, that this is a crime. So, uh, domestic violence law is not perfect as is right now. We have hope that amendments will make it better. It's primarily protective and uh, preventive, but it's not punitive. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a gap. It refers to the penal code, um, and that's more complicated because it does not punish all the aspects of domestic violence. However, it is, it, it is important because it also has mechanisms. For example, we never had protective orders. Now we have protective orders. It's very important. It uh, uh, stresses the need to train policemen and social workers and judges. Very important. Uh, opening of shelter, also very important. So there are aspects of the law that are much, much necessary and, and, uh, and timely. Uh, yes, there are issues of problems, reconciliation, and there is, for example, it refers to the penal code where it says that if the victim insults the abuser or uh, does something against the traditional values, basically cheating on the abuser, uh, that is a lesser punish, punishment. So, so you can, you know, even for murder, you know, you can have, and we had a case like that, instead of receiving the maximum sentence for murder, we received only three years because he felt that the woman was cheating on him without any proof. So uh, legislation is important again, but there is a lot. Uh, another aspect that is very important is that the European Union put a lot of pressure on Armenia to uh, pass this law. Of course, civil society had, it had its role from bottom up to put pressure. Uh, and also they asking them to prepare mechanisms for the law. We were asked to work with the police to prepare mechanisms for the law, and there is resistance, of course. These things do not come easy, you understand. And it's a, as Navar said, it's a process. It's, it's going to take time. Uh, there are going to be mistakes along the, the way, but there is a move forward, and this is what is important. We have to go through this path. It's pain, painful, but we have to do it. And to tell you frankly, it's been fast. I mean, if you consider that from 2010 to 2017, we already have a law. Um, uh, it says something. Uh, uh, for, furthermore, um, mechanisms also are important to implement the law. But it's the attitude. For example, I give you, uh, there's a study that showed that Turkey that has the best laws the best, um, they, they, they also uh, adapted the uh, Istanbul Convention, now in the, the Council of Europe Convention, which is the, the best law on domestic violence. But it, the domestic violence increases there. Why? Because the judges that have to put, make punishments, they are very lenient to men. You know, that patriarchal attitude is still so ingrained that it, he's entitled. You know, he should, he's a man, he knows what he's doing. That would be. So in society, if you don't pass that message that this is a crime and you're gonna be punished very severely for this, things like this continue. Now, there was a question about the rural and um, uh, uh, the half of the population we know that it's in Yerevan. Uh, even in Yerevan, there are certain uh, regions, I mean, the neighborhoods in Yerevan, that are very much like a village, Erebuni, uh, uh, or in uh, um, even Zeytun, in uh, Bangladesh. The, the, the makeup is very much like a village. It's private homes, in the streets, and all that. However, uh, Yerevan is much more sophisticated, it's much more emancipated, it's much more cosmopolitan. Uh, nevertheless, we get a high number of uh, domestic violence cases. 
The rural area is much more difficult because it's much more conservative and in, especially in the villages, everybody is sort of related to each other. So, for example, the, the husband might have a relative in the police or connected to the mayor. And so for the woman, it's very, really, very hard for her to come out and um, uh, report on, the, on, a, on a crime like that. There are uh, regions, in, uh, because we keep the data, uh, there are regions that they never report domestic violence. We never get a domestic violence case from those, from those regions. You know? And the police also try to cover up this. Situations. So there's a lot of education and a lot of work to be involved. Regarding the women in Karabakh, uh, in a war situation, uh, women become much more emboldened and they have a role to play. Remember the women during World War II in the United States? They were working. They were contributing to the war effort. The moment the war was over, they were relegated to become housewives. So the same process happens in Karabakh too. Yes, women are very much um, respected, and um, but they also have that the, the gender stereotypes exist there as well. They are much more emboldened sometimes, but they are also very uh, submissive too. And then we've had cases of domestic violence from Karabakh, even though it's such a remote from Yerevan, but uh, they do come. Uh, uh, what we also discovered that was shocking for us was the amount of sexual abuse of children. And the majority of uh, cases of domestic violence really come from families where there has been abuse in, in childhood. So, um, uh, and incest and things like that, that uh, we were shocked to see that there's quite a bit of a, of a number of that. Uh, the first question I couldn't really understand, if they can repeat it, uh, what is that? I, 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 acoustically, I couldn't understand. Maybe the microphone needs to open here. Okay, sorry. Um, so I was speaking with a friend recently. Her relative uh, did go to the center. Um, she had been beaten several times. It was a serious domestic violence situation, also from a rural area. Uh, but I think she stayed for about a month, I can't remember exactly, and I don't know the details of why she had to leave. I know it had to do with the center either running out of resources or there was some sort of reason that she was given that she could only stay in the shelter for a certain amount of time, I think it was about a month. Um, I was curious if that's something that's typical or if that's, you know, maybe a one-off thing. I, I don't know how it works. So if that is sort of um, not atypical, uh, then the, the question would be two parts. And the first would be, is it localized um, or legislative? I, I know we talked about the legislation, so legislative capacity issue there, in, at least in part. Uh, and the second part of that is, um, if you can speak to uh, any of you, uh, if diasporans can help, if it's a resource issue, um, can diasporans help, and if so, how, and with what specific resources? Okay. Thank you. Uh, there, there are two shelters in Armenia. I mean, there's another shelter besides us in Armenia. And they act more as a um, uh, uh, urgent relief shelter. They, they keep women very uh, short period of time is there. Uh, and it's like a cooling off period. And then when the tension diminishes, uh, they basically go back to the abuser. Uh, it's not the methodology that we go about. It's not the best standard methodology. Uh, but that's how they operate. Uh, in our shelter, the woman stay, can stay for up to three months. If there is a danger for her, if there is a security issue for her, or she's so traumatized, the effects of trauma are so strong on her, uh, that she cannot function on her own or take care of the children, she can stay uh, longer. But usually they stay for about three months, uh, depending. By the time they come out of the shelter, they, when they enter the shelter, they have to put three goals. What do they want to achieve by the time they come out of the shelter? And together with the social worker, the psychologist, they work towards attaining those goals. And um, by the time she comes out of the shelter, she has achieved that. She can either go back, go to extended family or um, you know relatives or whatever, or she can be on her own, um, taking care of her children. Um, and this is the empowerment model that we implement.
demand uh, for these women. Uh, the difference between the two shelters is that we have 73% um, they do not go back to the abuser, whereas the other uh, shelter have they have like, they say that 83% go back to the abuser. And this is normal because they don't work with the victim to empower her to find ways for her to come out of the abusive relationship. It's just a cooling off period. In terms of resources, that's a very good question and I can talk many, a lot about this because things happen with money everywhere. And unfortunately, international organizations and donor organizations, they do not give money for core um, uh, services uh, for functioning. Um, they give for training, for advocacy, for women's rights, whatever, but they don't give for running shelters. And donations are always welcome for, uh, and I rely very much on the diaspora for support on this. Right. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, uh, what, what has been characteristic to this panel that Nazar has been running uh, is we like to set time aside to examine the question of what can be done, what can the community do. So we'll have a conversation on that, we'll turn to that. But I was wondering whether Navarro or Maro could, maybe also since we're talking about the implementation of laws, uh, is there an investigation of the incident within the city council? What's the situation? Has there been, what's going on? Any update on that? Well, um, unfortunately, um, uh, that incident was um, labeled as hooliganism on the part of the council woman. So, uh, women are, who are victims, they're... Yeah, the woman who tried to raise awareness, awareness about the situation okay. of... Form of civic activism, that. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. Yeah. civic activism. Uh, she was accused of hooliganism. Uh, the, apparently, there is an ongoing investigation. They're going to drag on they drag on this for two years. Uh, it dies out, people forget, it passes on, probably there's going to be a fine, God knows what. Navar, do you have more information on this? On the councilwoman? No. No. Yeah, that's that's basically the practice, so we don't know. The, the aftermath, the, the conclusion of that is that, even worse, now uh, journalists are barred from entering the city council uh, to assist to participate in the meetings. So even more restrictions and, and yeah. That's, that's, that's very unfortunate, but I don't want to... Uh, let's do another... Uh, yeah? I have a question, uh, question for Nairi and a question for, for Denise. For Nairi, you, you made the connection and you talked about the connection in the literature between animal abuse and spousal abuse and child abuse. Have you experienced uh, on the ground, is there an awareness of, of this connection in your experience in, in Armenia, or, or is this something that you've encountered just in, in the scholarly uh, literature? And, and for, for Denise, did, are there other uh, post-Soviet states that have had more success in this department uh, that you can point to, things that they've, they've done that have been more or less successful than what's happened in Armenia? I just want to ask it briefly because uh, it's been a topic that discussed very much with the police because we work with the police for the mechanisms. Uh, abusers um, destroy everything that the victim gets emotional attached to. And one of the, and there is a risk assessment that we give. That, and one of the questions is, for example, did he beat you during pregnancy? Uh, does he have a gun? You know. The, Questions resources. and one of the questions is, did he um, kill a pet? Uh, because uh, whenever the victim makes an attachment to something, even uh, family photographs, destroying those, killing the pet, and those are very high risk uh, abusers that can commit homicides. So there is a strong correlation between that. But the reason I wanted to ask this question because these days we're working with the police and uh, telling them about this and uh, they, they, their comments are very sarcastic. That means that if I uh, cut off down Shunim, you know, if I hit the, the dog, uh, that means that I'm an abuser. Uh, if I tell the dog go away from here, <laughs> am I considered an abusive person? So they don't really understand the, the concept. Um, I think it's really great that you brought that up with the police, because I would say even here, 
it's not looked at enough and realized enough. Um, in the video I was watching in my class where this was brought up, the, the people were trying to advocate to work more with human rights groups because they had like found that they got a report of a dog that had been abused. They went to the house and they happened to see the child walking into the house with bruises everywhere and were able to report it. So um, it's hard. What I'm learning is in trying to advocate for dogs is one step at a time. And we still haven't completely gotten the woman part down. Um, but I think it's important for them to somewhat come hand in hand, um, even though it's difficult in a culture where uh, dogs aren't valued as family members the way they are here, but that, again, the people doing this are destroying everything in their path, so seeing abused women or children can be a sign that there's an abused animal in the home, seeing an abused animal home can be, in the home can be a sign that uh, there's abuse going on, and um, yeah, there can be a connection between law enforcement and groups that advocate for humans and for animals. Thank you. Denise? I'm so glad that dogs came up in this conversation. It's a huge dog lover. It's a great connection. Um, so post-Soviet states that have in, uh, done better, I suppose is the question, or I, I don't know if that's the way to put it. Um, I did a lot of research in Estonia. Um, this was the early 2000s, and they have been able to improve quite a bit in in regards to women's issues and women's rights. Um, a lot of it has to do with the influence of the Nordic states in that region. So they were getting a lot of funding from the Nordic Council of Ministers, um, from uh, Sweden especially, spent a lot of focus on, on that state. But also because they uh, wanted to join uh, first NATO and then the EU. And the EU accession requires, of course, that you implement legislation around women's rights, but not just implement them, but actually follow through. So the, the legislation is important, but following through. Um, there was also a lot of inf influence from um, sort of the Estonian diaspora, people that had left um, during um, World War II and the Cold War, and they came back. Um, I was in touch with a lot of women activists at the time who had come back to restart women's organizations there. So that influence is actually quite important. Um, but then also implementing um, CEDAW, so the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. They actually pushed really hard to implement um, that treaty that they had signed on to. And Armenia is also a signatory, so it's really about following through with those commitments. Um, and also at the time, um, Estonia had as many, if not most post-Soviet post states at this time, um, had a huge problem with human trafficking. Um, and so in order to um, sort of stem the tide of human trafficking, they also realized they had to focus on women's rights and getting more women um, into economic life, greater education, but also ending the sort of, or, or stemming the problem with sort of um, patriarchy that didn't think that women were um, useful in other aspects of society. So I would point to a study, obviously it's not perfect, but um, they've come a long way. Um, and they've come a long way in terms of democratization as well. So that's an important, um, to make. Yeah, and you mentioned, uh, Denise, you mentioned the Estonian diaspora, and I was wondering if we could, maybe we'll, uh, we'll start with Novart and then come down <laughs> to, to, uh, to our room. Uh, what role does diaspora, can diaspora play? What are the things that you think the Armenian American community can do from here in supporting their work? Uh, and I'm now hesitating to say the activists, the educators, the media, because I think we're left with much richer discussion here. Um, a richer framework than at least I uh, went in um, thinking about this. Never counter, what, what can we do? We can't hear you. Can you hear us? I wrote the government. Okay. Now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, what role the diaspora can play in uh, the transformation in terms of empowering women and generally. I think um, one very important aspect, there's a very nice um, interactive tool I tried years ago looking at the linguistic map of the United States and uh, it was actually measuring the level of produced text. I mean the frequency and the uh, 
volume of texts for the languages that populate the area of the United States, it was amazing to see the ratio of the population for, for the texts that were produced. And Armenians were very prominent, unlike the smaller numbers, the prominence of the language. Uh, the prominence of the persons in the U.S. and on that map was very impressive. So, it's not only our physical existence, it's what we produce culturally, what we are interchange, what we give and take. Uh, and I think the give and take goes beyond the, uh, you know, kind of financial uh, aspects that we jump to a very good conclusion. It goes really beyond it's this cultural contribution of worldviews, of attitudes, of norms, and I think this interplay and discourse that I guess we bring um, actually brings to the private, uh, private kind of undertakings is to take it to another level of uh, being it as part of the uh, entire Armenian network and uh, the Republic of Armenia feeling very much entitled to participate in the cultural and social processes. Uh, and as we were saying, don't need to be represented in the parliament to be constituted. Uh, you can do it with this sort of organized actions to activism, uh, to a contribution to a cause that is put to your heart. Um, I think that um, that's how I see personally uh, the importance uh, of having this wonderful network. And the fact that I can met the private B Boston in a very different time zone is one of the you know very fantastic things that the technology gives to us to connect whatever however our fascination allows us. Thank you. We're really excited that you could join the Mart indeed. Um, uh, Maro, do you want to add anything to the Can We Do question? Yeah, I just uh, um, wanted to add one thing. When we knew that there was a domestic violence law about to be discussed or to be uh, passed, uh, we were not sure yet 100%. So we went. We needed. We knew. We knew that it was about to happen, but they've been saying that for the past two years. So we needed to mobilize, and um, I um, asked my friends in the diaspora to start a petition and start letters and signatures to be collected and to be sent to the prime minister and to the president even. And then the president came in Geneva for some talks women there also asked indirectly will the domestic violence law be passed. So at every instance when issues come about for Armenia, whether it's gender issues or corruption issues or voting irregulations, I think we need to speak out as the aspirants. I mean, we come from democratic societies, you know, we're not from uh, uh, dictatorships, not yet maybe, <laughs> but so far so good. But uh, I think we need to uh, we need to speak out, and we need to uh, 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 make the government accountable. You know, EU is making the government accountable. They're saying you're not going to get free um, uh, visa um, policies. Yeah, visa mobility with the EU if you don't do this, this, and this. Okay, so we need to to work the same way with the government. We, we don't have to take photos with them all the time and, and kiss their hands, but we say that, okay, what, what have you done to empower women? How come women are not so much represented in the government? You know, and uh, uh, we don't should, uh, recently somebody has asked that to the uh, president, to Zer Sarkisian, and the, his answer was, oh, I would love to have more women in the government, but the problem is that we don't have women prepared for such positions, which is a classical denialist answer, okay? There are plenty of women very well educated. The mostly issue is... Mostly civil society, right? It, mostly it, leading civil society organizations. Yes, the problem is that they're not Republican Party members that you would want to have, but women educated, we have plenty. Very good, thank you. Um,
Okay, there are three more questions I'm going to collect from here. Let's do uh, one, two, three, four. I said three, but we'll take four. So one, two, three, four. There Hello, uh, this is for Denise, I think. Um, you talked about the empowerment of women from a political perspective, from an educational perspective, from a employment perspective. In your research, is there a correlation? I think I think there probably is a softer heart between family planning and the success for women and women empowerment because it seems like there's a correlation in terms of countries with very large birth rates and poor treatment of women versus Western European countries that have very poor birth rates and, and very empowered women. Um, well, I am from Armenia, so my perspective is um, kind of, I'm very uh, aware of some of the issues of what it is. Uh, now, one uh, point I want to make, and it's been uh, mind boggling for me for years and years. I grew up um, witnessing abuse in the neighborhood and knowing of things. And I always, when you talk about educating the population, I want to find out, do you ever consider educating the older generation of women? Because, and by that I mean like somebody in their 40s who already has a son who's getting married or is raising a son. Because one, um, what I've noticed always and it continues happening, as soon as the woman who herself has been abused uh, becomes a mother-in-law, it's become a huge deal. And they almost, they can't help on the new, they feel like their son can make no mistake, um, you know. So it's become a big problem that continues from generation to generation. And they become so defensive. I have months, I cannot talk to them about it. I've read an article that Armenia is on top of the list for gender um, selective abortions. They say, they're making that stuff up about us. There's plenty of girls in the city, you should go out. So, so they're in denial, and I think, by educating some of the older women and bringing them around, that we could help younger generations. So, is there work like that being done? And thank you for everything that you do. So, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, yes, I, my question actually follows on uh, to that question. I wanted to ask about um, educational um, efforts. You know, what are educational efforts that work? Um, you know, it's a really good question about uh, educating the older generations, but also with young girls and young boys. What are some of the programs that are actually very effective? Are these um, are these uh, required in schools, or is it really not um, very widespread still at this time? So, you know, I, I just want to hear what what has been effective. At least you might be able to uh, speak to that. And, in uh, you know post-Soviet countries, what is affected and what is currently being done in Armenia? And a hard question. Hi, um, I was wondering about um, if there are any efforts being made to um, less on the legislation and women's empowerment side, but more on the altering and affecting the culture of hypermasculinity that is very rampant in Yerevan. by just the difference of the culture and it, so it really stood out to me how it was so intrinsic in everything. Men were able to, men constantly were staring at people. It was expected for men to just sit at little cafes and stare at the women going by, but if women looked at them or made eye contact, it would show that they're interested in them, potentially romantically, little things like that. It was just small aspects that really added up to a point where it seems like it's a toxic level. The men are expected to be a man. There's so much emphasis on manning up that women occupying the same space on the same level or plane as them is a threat. And is there any efforts being done to help alter that? And if not, is there, do you have any ideas of what could be done and how we can go about helping gradually make a change there? 
You're talking about positive masculinity. It's a concept that the, I, one of the IWAM members, Julie Norsikian, has been talking about. So, um, how, how do we do this? We start, yeah, uh, Denise, let's start with you. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking about uh, family planning. I'm actually working on a book project on this right now, so it's near and dear to my heart. Um, the issue with family planning is that much of what we call family planning has actually come out of population control policies. It's a little bit different, right? So we talk about family planning, it's often associated with human rights and women's empowerment. These women get to make choices about her fertility and all of that. Well, two different things could happen. You could have family planning programs that really are about women's choice and uh, women's agency, or you have family planning policies um, that are about surveillance. Um, so, uh, Amartya Sen, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, did a, a, a comparison of, of policy, the one-child policy in China and then a policy in, um, in Kerala, in southern India, that focused not on fertility control, but rather on women's education. And what he found that when you had enforced um, population control family planning, so the one-child policy in China is an extreme example of that, which also leads to selective abortions and all of that. When you have enforced um, family planning, you actually don't get, um, it, the results are not as good as educating women. Um, so the low fertility rates that we see in Northern Europe, for example, um, which is almost to the point where it's like now the government is actually paying women to have children. Um, it's a problem. That's out of high levels of education of women and women's access to um, you know, high careers and those kinds of things. That's how fertility levels drop. Um, so the difference here is that education itself uh, for women and equal education for women is sort of a natural birth control rather than the other way around. So enforced family planning, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this in Indonesia as well. Um, doesn't necessarily lead to women's empowerment. Um, in the case of Indonesia, the two is enough campaign means that, again, there's this selection for boys, but also there's this whole cult of motherhood. It's all about being a mother. It's not about women's empowerment. So there's, that's my short answer for that. Um, so women's education. So, and then the question was what kind of education works and I cannot speak for Armenia, and I, and I won't. Um, and also the hyper-masculinity question. Again, this goes back to the question of the media and, and its cultural education, not just what's happening in, in schools. Um, I'm fortunate I teach at a women's college, so it's a very different environment, and, and those women are empowered, I can tell you. Um, but they're also running up against constantly what they're seeing in their own societies. And if it doesn't change in the media, then it doesn't then it
and looking at what are the methodologies that work the best. Um, but it's, it's difficult, it's difficult to combat it. Regarding super masculinity in Armenia, I have to say that my experience with volunteers when they come from Canada, United States, or Europe, um, the number one issues they can complain in coming to Armenia is the gender issue, is the sexism, is the misogyny. Um, and young, to them, as you mentioned, the environment is very toxic in that respect. Um, uh, I had to go to Birthright Armenia and talk to the volunteers and how to uh, handle these issues and how to uh, sort of understand where they come from so they're not that revolted by it, uh, rightfully revolted by it, but still to, to be able to handle it. Uh, it's a different society, it's a different mentality. Uh, we can understand that, but I can understand how to us um, it can be so um, revolting and, and discouraging and even disgusting at times. So how do you combat that is um, interaction, is creating an atmosphere where these issues are discussed, where um, you know, your peers, you can discuss these issues with your peers. The more we talk about these issues and the more we create the culture of um, uh, dealing with these issues uh, at personal level, at community level, uh, in the media, and so forth, that's the changes. Unfortunately, for example, those of you who come from Armenia, you know the soap operas in Armenia, Serial Nero, the famous Serial Nero, where women are constantly depicted as um, uh, victims. They are cheated, they are suicidal, they are beaten, they, uh, they are not empowered at all, they, they are at the mercy of their men. And these are not, and they are watched by 80% of the population because they, they pick the real life for them. That's what they say. But there are not good examples for society. And I know that uh, in Mexico there was a soap opera created where it deals with these issues and they've seen that domestic violence has dropped because of the soap operas that dealt in a positive way with the role of women. So media, yes, everything has a major role in how we deal with these issues. And, you know, if you get Armenian TV here, write and complain about these things. Nothing happens. But at the end, they give advice and they say what choices are, the way it's Western style. I notice at the end they summarize the episode and they explain it in the Western style. Yes, we presented your reality, but this is the solution. Stay out of their lives. They're young. They deserve to make their own decisions. Um, well, um, you know, but maybe, I mean, I don't know, because there are many, and what the, the, it's said to the diaspora to view, it's a much better, softer. A softer version, yeah. Yeah. Um, can I add something about the changing the environment just from my uh, perspective, my very, like, not expertise perspective? Um, I think another important thing, of, in addition to media and talking, is like, if we have these opinions and we want to share them, that we should be interacting with the community as well. And I think part of me, you know, was revolted. And I don't want to come back and I don't want to interact with these people. I don't want to be talked to like this. Um, but part of it is also, like, one of the people who asked the question was talking about how also having women like understand that they don't have to put up with this. And so seeing examples of other women not putting up with it is really important. And so shying away and getting annoyed doesn't help. But I think the more that we go back and interact, um, either moving back or spending time there is really important. Yeah, that's right. That's a really great point. Um, we're running short on time, and there are refreshments in the back. Uh, I guess I could take one more question, or we could just break and continue conversation. No, we take one more question. You have the last one. Uh, the question I was going to ask earlier was exactly what Mara just brought up about the soap operas, because I know that there have been other things done in like Kazakhstan with the BBC and so on. And just linking that now to uh, what someone asked earlier about what can the diaspora do specifically, it would be very interesting, I think, to see some diaspora um, 
uh, playwrights or people who can write for television to join the team in Armenia, not try to impose something from here to there, but to have some teamwork and that could be funded from the diaspora. It could be something uh, different than what's now broadcast and it could be something I think that you know, putting a, a sign at the end is, is really good for the people who watch to the end, but not everybody does and it's not quite as effective as actually having it acted out. I totally agree, Susan, with you, but uh, it's also taken into consideration that uh, television is privatized. And I remember, uh, maybe this is about five years ago, if not more, Minister of Social Affairs uh, uh, lobbied and wrote letters of protest uh, to the Commission of TV and Radio and TV because they were showing child abuse on TV. And they said that this is very, very dangerous, and this is not, should not be accepted, and this is not something to publicize like this on TV. It took them a year for, for it to be taken off the air. So this is the ministry asking the Commission of Television to regulate this. And it was very difficult. Uh, because there's, the soap operas are so popular, because they depict according to the population, they depict life reality as is. And, um, and they have advertisements because they are so much, so well viewed. They pay big money for this. The issue is, yes, to enter into collaboration definitely, but also is to lobby for better quality. If people from the diaspora watch this junk, complain about this. This is unacceptable. What level are we depicting here? The, the society is depicted here. Uh, maybe things will change. The, the image of Armenia, Armenia is very much concerned with its image. So if we complain about what image are you portraying of Armenian society, then I think that uh, will have an impact as well. Well, uh, please thank you. We have to uh, finish this component of the program. The refreshments in the back. I invite you to uh, continue approach our panelists. Unfortunately, we have to say good night to Navarro. Good morning. Thank you again, Navarro, for staying up so late.